All right. <clears throat> well, I've got things uh, I could introduce, but did you have something you want to talk about? You know, I'm, I'm pretty much uh, don't have any ideas today. Okay. Yesterday, you mentioned wanting to talk about the argument or arguments against libertarianism. You want to tackle some of those? Well, the argument for libertarianism really is a moral argument. We often express sub-arguments, aspects of libertarianism in consequentialist terms. And as, you know, it would be better, if we, wouldn't it be better if we did this? Wouldn't it be better if we did that? That's, that's, all, that's all piecemeal stuff. But the basic libertarian point of view is a universalizable statement. It's, we believe that the only universalizable moral, the only universal moral position is freedom. And uh, other positions based on more particular values are not universalizable, and they just don't work for everybody. It's going to be it's going to oppress somebody at the expense of others. You use the, the word shell, you use the word shelling point the other day. You remember? Remember? Yeah. How? Well, the neat thing about the libertarian idea is that it gets us out of negotiating our specific values. Wouldn't it be good to help this group more than that group or this person more? That's all, these are all particular value scales and people have different value scales. You know, they have diverse values and they have subjective value. They're actually, that's a, there's a difference between these two. The nice thing about liberty is it has a, it's a feature of human interaction. That is when you're free from somebody else's coerced influence. Um, that is a feature that is not uh, value-dependent. It's value-independent. You're free no matter whether you like it or not. And it turns out if everybody can be free, that's the one thing that we can all settle upon. So it's, it turns out that we can all give up the advantages we can gain from exploiting or uh, coercing others and just move our coercion back a step to defensive and retaliatory coercion. So we prohibit the initiation of force. And that's like a shelling point. It's, it's something you can settle upon without having to know what the specific agenda of the other person is. Arguably, behind the veil of ignorance, that's what actually people would choose. Uh, Rawls's thought experiment might actually turn out to be best met by libertarian ideas, which is the reason John Rawls's theory of justice, the first principle he comes on is the th principle of liberty. He doesn't come on to us egalitarian uh, in economic idea, the difference principle, until the second principle. His first principle is the principle of liberty, and I think that he should have gone further with it. He doesn't really take, treat the first principle seriously, but it is very, very serious to take indeed, and it has a lot to say for it. However, all this assumes that morals, that we can all be ethical, or that the human beings can be moral in the way that we're talking about, that, that morality is well suited to human beings as a social animal. The evidence for that position is murky. It's, I mean, we know that we can behave morally and treat people well, especially in a hands-off way in many circumstances, and that the rule of law does actually work best for lots and lots of people. However, we've always had a state in civilization, and we do know that human beings are awfully hierarchical and uh, in several different ways, and many of those hierarchies we feel best if they are um, coerced hierarchies, if we give authority to some more than others on a fundamental level. And that suggests that human beings may be too baboonish, too much like gorillas and chimpanzees and not enough like bonobos and orangutans to actually uh, make a universalizable system work. I'd like to believe it were not true. I don't know. That's one of the reasons I'm an agnarchist when it comes to... Uh, my the ideal political system the closer you get to freedom we'll find out how far human beings can adapt to freedom that's something we'll find out but from our position right now um being more free and less uh, collectivist less coerced uh less exploitative all those things that makes a great deal of sense so i don't have any problem with pushing in a libertarian direction, but whether libertarian systems can actually work and survive and whether they'll maintain by the creatures that we very much are is open to doubt. Well, this almost sounds like the, the socialist idea that we have to change the nature of man to make our system work. Well, the nature, well, not necessarily, well, that's what I'm asking. Is it the nature of man or is it merely changes at the margin that we're going to be changing? We don't know that. 
how deep, I mean, we, people do adapt to their societies. A person in a totalitarian society behaves different from our society, right? Russians under uh, communism behaved radically different than we do. Not so radically different than it's behaved with on, on uh, college campuses. Uh, <laughs> that's one of the reasons college campuses are such crazy places these days. Uh, but that's behavior. Human nature is a more nebulous concept, right? And I'm not, we, we just want people to adapt. It's, it's a question. It's, it's, it, we don't know how far adaptation goes. We don't really know where the, you know, the rubber meets the road on the further you go down certain directions. Well, we do know that socialists, when they try to push towards a socialist system, we do know that they don't succeed in making a socialist system. They see, what they succeed in making is a lot of graves, mass graves, a lot of, a lot of, uh, starvation, and a lot of just nightmarish totalitarian conversion. And there's a reason for that. The socialist assumption of making, of remaking man is utterly unrealistic. It doesn't understand the nature of human cooperation. So, and what human beings can even do. So I think that the human nature argument is, is a good one against real socialism, that is against the idea of getting rid of money and working all through centralized systems. And, or, or without the without the state that we would all share and share alike, and that would work. That's not going to work. That's absurd. It does never work uh, beyond the family, clan, and maybe tribe level. But even a tribe had many uh, many forms of cooperation. So, I, I'm I'm very dubious. I, I don't really don't see Co how co cooperation as opposed to coercion. Well, cooperation as opposed to non cooperation and and uh, and uncoordinated strife. I mean, coercion, yeah, yeah, initiated coercion. There's a problem with using the word coercion is that it has several meanings. So oh, well, we, have, we have problems all around. Do you think libertarians use it in, in, in those several ways, or is there a strictly libertarian use of the word well, coercion? I, I don't like, libertarians often call initiated force coercion, and they call retaliatory and defensive force not coercion, and it's, it's, an, absurd, it's an absurd position. Oh. Uh, Hold on. All right. Okay, go on. <laughs> um, I don't know. It may just be quibbling about words, but uh, it sure is an awfully handy term for libertarians. I mean, you understand why, why they use it, right? Yeah, but there's a problem. If you're going to be using words at variance, the more words that you redefine in your jargon way, the less you're going to be communicating to people outside your community. That's a damn good point. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> I've had to squeeze that. a lot of that stuff out of my... Uh, you have, there's a lot of, and that's one of the problems I have with many forms of natural rights theory, is that it seems to be so defining the concept to load it in our direction that other people say, well, I just don't mean, I don't mean that when you say that. I mean, I, that's not what we mean, you know. So you have to actually be able to, when it comes to, let's say, rights theory, you have to, have to actually be able to marshal lots of different arguments to show that your view of rights makes more sense. So there are no shortcuts. This is one of the things that I think that libertarians don't understand is that there are not really any shortcuts to communication and, and convincing people. You do actually have to mount many different forms of argumentation and evidence and reasoning. They're just You have to mount a lot of stuff. And in fact, there are, I, I think what I once counted seven different forms with which we can change other people's reasoning in terms of behavior. Seven, seven different ways that we can engage with somebody else to convince them to behave some different way. Mm -hmm. And libertarians seem to... Um, seem to limit themselves in funny ways. And I, I, and I, in fact, I think that often libertarians, one of the reasons libertarians- well, Wait, wait a minute, hold on. What were the seven ways? Well, I mean, <clears throat> there are, there's, there's a whole bunch of, like, I'm not gonna explain all seven of them, but there's two obvious ways. You have ways. to explain them all, just, <laughs> well, just give me a- Well, you, you can get people to change their, you can tell people that, oh, it's for your long-term interest. I mean, why would you want to do something? Well, because maybe oh, so you don't want to are, do These now. are elements of persuasion is what you're talking about. Well, the so category- not including things like holding a gun to the guy's head. Well, no, it does include that because one of the other ways of doing it is by threat. You can get somebody to change their behavior by threat. You can also get to change people's behavior by uh, enticement. You can also get to change people's behavior by empathy. Uh, you say, oh, um, Think about how the other person feels, and just and as soon as the person thinks of it, says, "Oh, I don't really want to do that. Let's stop. Uh, you know, let's stop killing and raping them." I never thought about it before them. They actually have feelings. That actually does change people's behavior. Empathy is an amazing tool. 
but they're, that's just one of, one of uh, a handful or seven or something. I, I forget. It's been a long time. Since yeah, I, I get the spirit. I see how, what you're going. Okay. I see where you were going. And it's just that my, my wonder, I wonder about libertarian ideas to the extent to how far we can push them. The further we, the further we demand that we go do something different than we have now, the more evidence you need that that would work. And we don't even have some of that evidence because we're so far away from it. We have a huge state with lots of redistribution, lots of regulation. And well, wait we a minute. Is, is it fair to, to prove that something will work before you do it? Isn't it, I mean, isn't the scientific method, well, I don't know if it's, I don't know if that's how you do it. It doesn't make more sense to find, at least build on what you know won't work. That is, we have lots of evidence about what won't work so far. Yeah. But, well, but is the is there some onus on us to prove that what we're saying will work in the future? Well, yeah, because I mean, I mean, the, the question is, in the future, what will work now? What will work tomorrow and the next day and the week after we do this or this or this, and then in a month from now, and then from a year from now, are we setting up a system that ha- that reinforces reinforces itself? Will the system be maintained? But there are ways of doing the right thing that won't, re- that won't be maintained, too. That's the other thing that I challenge libertarians, and in fact, anyone who is engaging in reform. There are some reforms that you can make, but if you make them in the wrong way, they're not going to last long. I think that one of the things we have a problem right now in mainstream political thought, and one of the reasons I believe so people are so crazy today is that we have a system that is not stable, that is not um, sustainable. We have a system wherein the government, governments, in fact, on the state level as well, often spend more money than they can possibly pay back. And that sets up a financial system that's doomed to collapse. Well, this is not a sustainable system, and this can really kick us in the ass. I mean, it's even possible that what we're engaging in now throughout the West could end civilization. It's possible. I don't know. I'm hoping not, and I don't think so. So you sound like a kook when you start saying stuff like that. Well, yeah, anyone who says that, I mean, but but you sound like a kook when you say that in 10 years' time, we're, the, the sea level is going to rise 80 feet. Well, <laughs> Al Gore and nearly every one of my progressive friends believes that kind of stuff. So being they a kook they never say that They never say that they're a kook. They sound like a kook. Well, I'm willing to actually, I, I was, you know, for a long time. I Plus, everybody I, threatens the end of the world. I mean, that's a political tool. Yeah, that's what yeah. makes, but I don't what makes people... Act. I mean, there's one of your things of persuasion is right, right. It's is, a long term uh, consequence. But, but the further we go down the line, no, is, 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 is tomorrow that you know things are going to end. Yeah. The, Everybody the problem, says that. Yeah. The, well, the problem is that some systems are going to end. We all. I mean, we know that everything that you know. And and if you set something else, if you set something up and run it as if it's going to collapse at some point, and that's how we've set up the the federal government's. Uh, finances. It's a system that cannot be maintained at some point. We don't know when that point is. That's one of the problems of prediction is that um, we're all kind of surprised that it lasted as long as it did because deficit spending and cre- increasing debt now to $20 trillion in official debt and hundreds of trillions of dollars in promissory debt. That's an astounding position to be in when you compare it with the GDP, the annual GDP is. Well, and, so why on, why on earth do our do our creditors have any faith in uh, in us? Why are they still lending us money? Well, partly because they're desperate. Where else are they going to put the money? Uh, and if we go down, see, that's the thing, is that if, if we go down, the, the Western Europe probably goes down, there's a whole bunch of systems that go down with us. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why so many countries that were invested in us for so long. But you realize that China no longer invests in, invests in t- uh, treasury bills as strong as it used to. China is... A lot of countries. No longer it does it as much as it used to. Well, it's, it's a decre- they've decreased their holdings. So they've decreased their, 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 they are moving more and more of their funds, as I understand it, into gold. Uh, Germany has also increased their gold holdings. Uh, Switzerland has increased their gold holdings. There's a lot of countries that are increasing their gold holdings. Seem to be bracing for something. That's what I think they're doing. Maybe they're just hedging. We don't know. But the, the dollar doesn't seem to be long-term stable. Maybe it is. Maybe I'm all wrong. But when it, when an economic system collapses, a lot of things can happen, and it can be really chaotic. We know what happened with the hyperinflation of, of Weimar Germany. Uh, it it didn't collapse so much as morph into Nazi Germany. That was not a great step forward. It puts a tremendous strain on the society. In other words, well, it puts the strain on everybody because, of course, you know, six million Jews and hundreds of thousands and millions of people dead later. Uh, in war, that was a that was quite a 
That was quite a response to having a stupid economic policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know what the, I mean, we're different from Weimar Germany. Our monetary system is not controlled directly by the government. Uh, our, our monetary system is controlled by a plutocratic cartel. And that, that kind of system has never gone into hyperinflation. But that means also that at some point it's going to put the brakes on some, on some strain and raise interest rates. And when that happens, of course, if you have a huge uh, debt load maintenance, that means that most of your, the revenue of the, of the federal government goes to maintaining debt, to you know, paying off its debt in this debt load uh, every, every month or year or whatever. And that seems like it could be an awful strain on the system. And I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, I'm not an economist. I just look at the, well, even, even somebody like uh, Nassim Taleb looks at the situation and he, and he he doesn't think that the financial collapse of the, of the federal government and, and the American economy is a black swan event. He believes that is a predictable event. We just don't know what the timeline is. So we have to, we, we have to be concerned about that kind of stuff. And libertarians who promote certain reforms should be concerned. For instance, libertarians may have, the libertarian politi- politicians in America uh, have made several major reforms. In Alaska, they they put a sort of profit sharing plan into place that gave it, what is it, several thousand dollars a year to Alaskan citizens from the revenue of, uh, of oil taxes. That was a libertarian? Uh, they were the ones largely responsible. That's what, They're the ones who shared it, that made the share out. Well, as uh, John Stossel noted, that's basically a, a sort of a socialistic share out system um it's it's where you use the state to provide uh, you know benefits to all its members and they're using taxation as the revenue source and that has had some rather strange consequences for uh, uh alaska and it's in politics too and it's not necessarily good ones uh, giving people free money uh, is uh, i think is you know that's a that's a dangerous thing and uh and, and Americans, uh, there are there is a, there are several libertarians who want to put a universal basic income in, in place, which is to grant everybody you know a, a basic like a twelve thousand dollar a year stipend, and then tax that away for the people who make more money. And uh, we don't know what that'll do to people, but I think that it would it would not be in a libertarian direction. I think it would actually make things worse. Uh, and there's a lot of systems that sound good on the face of it that sound more libertarian or more socialistic and they have varying degrees of stability. So what do you, what, what would you advise libertarians on, on, on this issue then? Uh, don't be idiots. I don't know. Be very careful. <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, I'm not, don't, a don't assume it's as simple as yeah. simple to right. legislate right. as you think. Right. Right. That, that there, there is a tendency to, to, to among libertarians to just, be, be aghast that outsiders can't see how simple it is. Well, there's a sort of simple elegance about its, its central insight, but that doesn't mean it's simple to, to actually implement. Right. Well, especially if you have a state that's so involved in everything. Um, and so how do you unbuild a state? You know, the, the, the number of states that have been built down, you know, by planning or by presidential or legislative action or whatever like that, that have actually decreased their size as the society was growing. There's very few instances of that. In American history, I can think of two radical decreases in the size and scope of government. Um, I understand, and I've not researched, uh, in Texas Republic under Sam Houston in one of his administrations, he scrapped the Navy. He sold the, he sold the Navy. He basically destroyed the Texas Navy and sold it all for scrap. Um, that and he did a number of other things that were just quite radical, and that was an amazing that was an amazing decrease in the size and scope of government when Houston did that. Similarly, Warren G. Harding after World War One and after the the uh, untimely uh, stroke ridden presence of uh, Woodrow Wilson, he just basically unbuilt the war machine and most of the regulations that were attended with it. To the, to the great disappointment, we should remember of most progressives because the progressives were talking about war socialism. The World War I made progressives feel really, really confident that, oh, we're socializing everything for the war effort. We should do, do, do this during peacetime, too. But like John Dewey and many others who were arguing for um, increasing the size of go- government after the war, and the war gave us precedent and uh, you know, precedent and an excuse and evidence that their system would work. And instead, uh, it's true. I often hear 
modern day socialist, uh, counting one of the one of the great uh, successes of American socialism is the military. Yeah, well, um, the, the thing about the military, though, is you know we, we I've always known that government can do a number of a limited number of things. You know, by you know, they, they do they do things. You know, the government does things. No one's denying that, and anyone who pretends that they're denying it because it doesn't work as well as we as people say it's going to work is kind of silly. I mean, uh, it does work. I mean, it works in a fashion. Yeah, it, things it are sort it of it, it doesn't work along. in a utopian fashion. It doesn't work as as well as people think, and it actually has some really deleterious effects. Well, right? here's an okay. Before we get to this, this reminds me of another libertarian um, problem. Um, back up a little bit. Remind me where we were. Well, we just—I just mentioned that 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 uh, Harding was one of the few people who actually d decreased the size of scope of government in, to a great degree, uh, and uh, didn't do what he was told by his advisors to do, which was, for instance, uh, engage in a lot of uh, spending. In fact, Herbert Hoover thought he should engage in a lot of spending to prevent a, a, a depression. Well, they were going through a collapse after World War One, and it lasted only a year long. There was no Great Depression in 1921. It was a, a quick recovery. But it was a huge, dramatic collapse because, of course, the whole economy had to re rethink itself because it was, it was the whole economy had been sort of geared toward this huge war effort, sending lots and lots of people, you know, soldiers over to, to finish the, the World War One, you know, the Great War, as they called it. And, uh, and Harding didn't do what his advisors told him. He just... He just Signed down and and, and uh, dismantled the uh, the American uh, the resistance state, and they had a re re remark. I mean, it wasn't a complete. It didn't didn't, didn't completely uh, collapse down, but it did. I mean, there was a ratcheting up effect. There was more government after World War One than was before World War One, but nevertheless, it was not nearly the ratcheted up effect as there was in World War Two or the Vietnam War or the current wars. Is that well, I'm guessing a modern progressive would argue that. Yeah, right. He tore down the state, and then look what happened. Wall Street plunged the world into a depression. And, yeah. and that's only, that's just the example. Well, that's nine years later, and then we have to look at why the, uh, why the uh, depression occurred. And, and, and that's a fascinating subject. And, uh, and I, uh, I hold to the uh, McManus and uh, et al. view in, in the central banking in, the, uh, in, their, in a great book that they wrote. I'll, I'll, we can put it in the, in the low bar if, we, if, we, if this stays in the uh, discussion. And uh, it's a fascinating book on why the Great Depression occurred. And there's, you have to think of three factors. And it was not because of Harding's, Harding's uh, build down on the state. It was because of the actions of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve was actually trying to prop up Great Britain. They said a lot of, they, they've inflated the money supply because Great Britain had done something stupid in terms of policy. And so the Federal Reserve in America was trying to bolster up uh, Great Britain. And that led to a, you know, about an eight-year boom period. It was a recovery, but there was a boom period afterwards, and that led to the huge collapse. <coughs> I mean, if if uh, if Harding's unbuilding of the state after World War One were a, such a disaster that it that, then the real that it would have been a Great Depression after World War One. There wasn't. So the argument is, is specious. Um, had the state been building up? just slowly been building up again after Harding dismantled it? Well, I mean, it, the, the state is... I'm not, not, maybe I'm overstating it, but it, 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 I mean, how long, how long did that reduction last? Well, I mean, it didn't grow much under Harding and Coolidge because Coolidge, you know, famously believed that the business of government is business, which, we, which, which he meant is that it should pretty much get out of the, you know, it shouldn't do much. But there were a number of things the government was doing too much of it during that period. And in fact, it did a few things very, very badly. Well, the world had a belly full of government at that point, right? At the end of the Well, world. but not like it does now or not like it did after Roosevelt got in office. Or I mean, even they'd, like, they'd watched, you know, they'd watched a huge portion of the population be slaughtered by by these high, high sounding uh, words from the state. I mean, well, yeah. how well, else do you account for the fact that we have Harding and Coolidge all of a sudden um, and this long period of anti-government sentiment? I mean, where else well, did it they was, It was also anti-intervention. The, the, the desire to go to fight another war was very, 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 very low in America until the attack on Pearl Harbor. Harbor. I mean, if it wasn't for Pearl Harbor, if the Japanese hadn't attacked America, the, the chances of us going into war, I mean, we may not, have, America may not have gone into full war against even Hitler, uh, as, as wonderful as that would have been. Uh, 
I mean, Hitler needed to be taken down. So, I so, so the popularity of Harding and Coolidge was due not so much to uh, an interest in limiting government as as an interest in trying to get away from war. Well, I mean, were they known as anti-war men? Well, too? I mean, they, they were not warmongers. I mean, yeah. uh, well, Coolidge. I mean, um, Wilson presumably wasn't either, was he, at the beginning? Well, he was a progressive of a very uh, of a very extreme sort, and progressives love war. They pretend not to like it today, but back then they loved war. That's why war socialism was such a big deal in, among the progressives. But we, we're, we of course, we're, once again, have run far afield from the main... Well, I think that's fine. I think this series should be more about uh, uh, sort of meandering through... Uh, uh, libertarian oriented philosophical issues and so forth and seeing where we arrive and and seeing if we can get some sort of um, engagement with other people that are thinking about these things yeah well like I say my only main concern about libertarianism is not that freedom is good or not that more freedom would be great but that I don't know how far how much freedom human beings can handle I just don't know. And I didn't mention the other interesting, uh, other interesting. Well, well, if that were the case, then maybe what we have now is the best we can do then. Well, maybe it is. Well, we'll find out. But I don't, I don't, th I don't think there's a reason to believe that. I believe that, well, for one thing, we know that's not the case because our system is not stable right now. If our system was stable and we had a sustainable, you know, uh, fiscal and, and, and uh, fiscal system and so forth, and we didn't have increasing secular unemployment, even while we have Full employment. Uh, I mean, you know, the number of people who are working is just decreasing. It's just, it's just weird. The percentage of the population. It's not all just because of people getting old. Though that's a part of it, uh, and that is also a problem, as we all know. Uh, the baby boomers uh, retiring is is, is, a, is going to be an increasingly bad problem. But all that being said, um, we don't really have reason to believe that we have the proper purpose, perfect system now, or something like it is perfect. We have every reason to believe that it's way too much government and, and, and horribly mismanaged. And it's horribly mismanaged for a number of obvious reasons. Uh, one of them is the way democratic republics work with the concept of, of redistribution and regulation on a, on a, on the basis of uh, uh, the basis of democracy. I mean, it's just that these these things conflict. The only way to make a the only things that you re let's we start over again. If one were trying to get a stable um, a stable welfare state to work, I think it would be helpful to have a monoculture, to not have lots of different cultures in a melting pot, and it would be helpful not to have a democracy. Um, but Well, despite its claims, uh, the left is certainly... Um, God, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You, you go back well, to... Um, we just, I mean, if, if you were going to say that uh, on the left, there is a strong anti-democratic streak, that would be an appropriate thing to, to note because they do have a strong anti-democratic streak. Uh, my favorite example, of course, is the economist Brad DeLong, who, or, who's a proponent of technocracy. Uh, he's a Keynesian economist who's a proponent of technocracy, and he just wants the experts to be in charge. And he's always, and he just, he just, he just pulls his hair out how awful the. This is a, this is a popular progressive position. I mean, it's it's been reinvigorated through people like Warren and Hillary, and yeah, I mean that whole crowd. I don't know what's going to. I guess Bernie would be a technocrat as well, right? Yeah, probably. Uh, it's. Um, We'll have the right people in place to carry. Well, that's the that's see that's. Don't that's worry. The, this isn't like the disasters of before. We'll have experts in socialism. Right, see, that's see that's the problem with these uh, these leftist systems and these these de resistance systems is that it all depends on the right people being in place. Whereas I prefer systems wherein that can handle that don't go completely haywire, even if bad people are in place. Uh, let's say people that, that Trump is like Hitler. Let's say that, I don't believe that's true. I believe that's nonsense. But let's say it is true. Uh, then maybe it was a bad idea to give more and more power to the president of the United States all these many decades. An institution, uh, yeah. That had yeah. So that's, so much all that's, see, that's the idea, original idea of the founding fathers for all the errors and, and idiocies that they had, did have a fairly, you know, jaded view of human nature. They believed that human beings could be trusted with much power. So they wanted a system that had checks and balances and had countervailing powers and that kind of thing. And what we've discovered is that, uh, that uh, some of those accountability powers have just completely failed. And we now have an imperial presidency and a completely irresponsible and kind of uh, deferential Congress. And, and that's at its best. It often becomes uh, um, just 
really bad. I mean, it's just it's 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 a it's a it's an unworkable system, uh, and we have the strange sorts of strange sorts of uh, clogs in the system. There's sort of a demo sclerosis going on on, on almost every level. And that's largely because we, we they've tried to do things that just aren't possible to do in a big in a big republic, and uh, and it's because we've gone way too much of the dirigist degree, the, too much control, too much government control, too much regulation, too much uh, too much redistribution, too much taxation, too much spending of all types. Uh, governments everywhere they've armed many m- most branches of its government now are armed and go about it's just it's 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 nuts on so many levels, and I don't think that there's any good case that we're anything like where we should be. So we need to unbuild a lot of that and we should maybe look at how uh, examples of unbuilding and it happened elsewhere as well. But all this depends on people understanding what's going on. And in America, uh, we have- Well, it seems to be a mass hypnosis or or, or the the country seems to be in a kind of trance. Well, I think people are kind of, well, we have several different things going on at once, right? We We have progressives who've gone exceedingly crazy uh, with their goofy uh, isms, uh, you know, their anti-racism, their anti-sexism, their uh, intersectionism. Anti-racism that is at, at its core racist. Anti-sexism yeah. that is at its core sexist. Yes. And that's that's one of the reasons they're sort of crazy, is that they they push themselves in a direction that makes no sense. And that's why they're contradicting themselves with these cognitive dissonances that are just astounding. And then you have something called the alt-right, which is... Uh, the version of the progressives, except that they believe in racism and they believe in sexism, and nationalism, uh, straightforward and nationalism. Yeah, it's all and and the, the the progressives tend to be anti-nationalists, though they really want to increase the sizes of all nation states. So it's just it, it, there's, there's so many contradictions involved, and then for conservatives uh, who've been waffling around for, you know since 1980. Um, thinking they do stuff that's really remarkable, but they don't really do much at all. In fact, they, they're, their politicians betray their constituents over and over and over again. And those constituents have gotten so crazed and so disgusted that they lashed onto a person who wasn't a conservative. I mean, and who was just, you know, just a sort of a, a chaos figure. Uh, and he's and he's so hated by the the, the left that they love him. Uh, so we have we have Trump because of all this craziness because the Republicans politicians betrayed their base over and over and over and over again. There are several bases, all of them except the neocons. The neocons completely failed, and the, the progressives have gone completely crazy. So in that environment, woohoo, we got President Trump. And this is all the result of the fact that we don't have a stable system. And I think people are just sort of dazed and confused. Uh, Americans are dazed and confused. It's a great title for it. Well, there's no such thing as a stable human system, is there? Well, there's, there's, How could there's, degrees, of, yeah, well, there's degrees of stability. And if, if this is radically unstable, I, I mean, I, I believe that, that uh, the, the basic spending and uh, debt structures of the United States government, the federal government, is radically unstable. It is on a, it is on a uh, course, a destined course to, to, to disaster. And I think lots of people believe this. Well, Pete, there's, I mean, everybody says the world's on its course to disaster, though. But I'm not saying the world's on this course. I, I don't think, for instance, I don't think that the environment is, is, is going to be as bad as, you know, the, the global climate change is going to be as bad as people think it is. I don't think that's the big issue. I think we do have huge issues that should be solved that because we're, because some people are spending all their energy on things that aren't as important, we're not solving them. I think the big environmental issue of our time is the oceans, the pollution and the complete mess that the oceans are in, and they're getting worse. And I, I am actually really worried about this. And this getting short shrift because no one can stop thinking about the climate. And that's just the wrong, it's the wrong way to deal with issues. And the other thing, is, and, and, uh, and then of course, I mean, and then and once, once again, you have to choose which, which, is the, which is the most likely, which is the most likely end of you know, civilization. I mean, one end of civilization would be nice. Uh, th- there's a chance of, there is one way the pl- life on the planet could easily be destroyed. And it could very well happen in the next, any time. And that is an asteroid hit the, pl- hit the planet. For that reason, I think that it would be nice if the, if the world were in space. That is, if, if there was a huge industrial complex in outer space. And the, the way to do that is to get government to stop being, behaving like insane, insane people and get rich people to get excited about going into space. That's That's... Because once we're up there on the moon and in orbit and maybe even to Mars, once we're doing that, when we find out that there's an asteroid coming, we'll be able to do something about it. 
if it happened right now and it was headed direct, straight for the earth, you know, Ellie, uh, a life extension. Ex, uh, Could we send Bruce Willis to take care of this? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that, that is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Deep Impact was uh, better. And that, was, and that was still just, anyway. Okay. Um, so let's see. Circling back around to arguments against libertarianism. So far, we've talked about maybe the arguments we've talked about so far are libertarians' um, um, impracticality, or how, how would you characterize what we've talked about so far? Well, I mean, I worry that libertarians sometimes insist on a whole package that is not tested. Uh, so I think that we should test. Or we should start testing other, uh, other, you know, more peace bill, you know, just little uh, smaller reforms. For one thing, I think we should insist that the government spend less. I think this. I think we've tested something that doesn't work. I think we've tested less taxes. It was tested by Reagan. It was tested by others, and I believe that that sh is shown to not work. It doesn't str con uh, constrain uh, the spending of the federal government. We thought that the starve the starve the beast idea would work to constrain spending, and it didn't work. We just borrowed and borrowed and borrowed. So I think we have to try something different. So the obsession with taxes, though I would like to have a very simple tax system, and I think it would be a boon to mankind, and maybe the current system that's comp contemplated by the uh, Republicans is a good idea. Um, I think that talking about in taxes incessantly is the wrong way to go do it if you're trying to constrain government. You have to decrease the size of the spending. Oh, so you, because you, I mean, libertarians do insist on. Uh, 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 but they, were, they do a remarkably poor they, job of... of but of, but uh, they should turn their attention away from the idea that uh, lowering taxes moves us toward freedom. Yeah. And just turn their... And focus their, their attention on the spending part. Yeah, spending. Well, I mean, one thing I think we have to do is going to be the hardest to do because Americans are so addicted to uh, a uh, worldwide presence in, in, in the war machine. Uh, being the world's policeman is something that America... Is it Americans or is it uh, sort of a, a, a elite establishment? Well, I think Americans too. I think it's elite, definitely an elitist establishment. And when you look at the Europeans, you can see why we've done it. It's just, the Europeans are just unreliable assholes. And uh, they, they, they can't agree on... I mean, one of the I mean, one of the reasons we have had stability in Europe is because America was largely in charge and taking up the burden. Um, because the Europeans are... These, these, are, these are deeply deeply weirded out people. I don't know what to say about the Europeans. I don't know. We're going to see. I mean, the EU is now moving towards having, uh, uh, towards getting a uh, national police force, uh, a, a military, which is probably going to be a disaster. I mean, it's almost certainly going to be a disaster. The Europeans are just a, a, a very bad, they, sh they, they, they shouldn't have any, they're, they're bad. They're, 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 let's, they're, put, let's put rifles into the hands of as many different sorts of Europeans as we can. Well, the problem is they're trying to centralize it, and I don't think that's going to be any better. I mean, that's, <laughs> especially Germany in charge, once again. <laughs> Germany, Germany it's, rules. It's like a Peter Sellers movie. No, no, no. I, I definitely think that, that America should pull back, but they shouldn't have a EU. Uh, well, I don't think the EU is a good idea, period. I, I think that they should have uh, uh, simply have... Uh, simpler free trade agreements, but not have a centralized government. I think it's a disaster. I think it's going to be, it's, it's going to be a, a huge problem. And the, but there are other huge problems involved too. I mean, we do all live under time of, oh, there's some major stressors. We live at a time when uh, Muslim immigration is a stressor upon civilization. I don't know how bad that's going to be, but it's there and it's a stressor and, and it's a bad thing because second generation Muslims seem to be more radical than the first generation Muslims. And that's not good, at least in, Europe, but that's probably because Europe does something more more badly than America. As you say they, they do they do a, they have a bad program bigly compared to America, <laughs> and their bigly bad program is that they uh, keep immigrants uh, and put them on the dole rather than make them work, uh, and that is not good for people. In fact, I think that one of one thing libertarians should advance right now. I think there should be some basic policy changes at the constitutional level in America. And libertarians should support them. And I think one of them should be that the federal government should never, ever give any money to anyone who's not a citizen of the United States. No money of, of, of any kind of privilege or immunity, that no money should be spent on the health care or the uh, food of anyone who's not an, a, a so citizen you, of the United you'd States. So be, you'd be okay with poor Muslim babies starving on the street if that, if... Uh, 
Uh, well, I would think that Muslims would be uh, uh, helping own their own Muslims out. So I don't think they would be that much star- starving. But I don't know. They're pretty, they're pretty rowdy among another, so they probably wouldn't. So, but well, it'd be, no, okay, with, so it'd be okay just to leave the innocent and dying alone. Well, no, I don't think that's, how, that's not how it works. I mean, actually, Muslims would step up to the plate. In America, they would, because we, our Muslims are better than Muslims elsewhere in the world, because we are a free country. We're a freer country than almost anyone else uh, on some levels. And if we didn't give them free goodies, they would actually work harder and they would be less terroristic and they would actually step up to the plate. I believe this is, this is the problem I have with Gavin McGinnis's uh, uh, sort of total detestation of Islam. Uh, I'm not sure how he accounts then for the um, very American uh, Western oriented uh, Muslims in America. I mean, Islam obviously works in America for these people. For a lot of them, there's, there's a lot of problems with Muslims in America, but they're not as Muslims as Europe. That's, that's, that's the thing you have to remember. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, Muslims have a few things that are really great. I mean, they're like the Mormons in one sense, is that they tend to be nice to their own kind, um, and, but uh, not as good as the Mormons. No one's as good as the Mormons. The Mormons are the best, the, the best uh, care of their own group that there, there is of any religion around, as far as I can tell. And uh, do you, are you, or do you have any association with any Mormons? Yeah. Oh, you I've do. been around Mormons all my life. I know Mormons. No, no, I'm just make, making sure you're not being paid for this political announcement. No, I mean, it's not political. I mean, I think their ideas are stupid. Uh, <laughs> but but having stupid ideas isn't... And, 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 and uh, I mean, I think that Islam is, is, is a horrible religion. I think it's just evil. But... Well, so have, how do you account for these decent, civilized... Uh, well, because uh, no, very liberal American Muslims. Right. Well, I mean, because you mean, no, are you just saying, though, they're ignoring their religion? That's why. Well, no, no, no. There's good parts of every religion. I mean, there's good parts and bad parts. I just think that at the core of Islam, there's a huge evil that's worse. It's worse than almost ever, 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 every other religion. And what's that's that, the what, what's, what's the core, as you see it? Well, I mean, they have a strong. They're, well, the, they have a Start strong. Start again, because uh, the NSA blocked our signal there for a second. Okay. Uh, you know, once again, we're for a field, but uh, <laughs> I think it's okay in this series. It'll be okay. Okay. Just, okay. Well, I'm okay with a sort of a shaggy dog approach. Yeah, to this is this is really a shaggy dog. But uh, yeah. well, I mean, the the, the thing that's good about uh, Islam is the thing that's bad about Islam is that it's good to the in group and it's bad to the out group. See, it's an in group out group thing, and almost all religions have a strong in group out group orientation. Well, you want us? You want America to be an in group and them to be an out? I don't actually. I don't. I just think that that it's bad for. Uh, I think welfare is bad. Uh, I think giving people things for free is a very very bad system all around. But it's really bad for people who are coming from other countries because that means that they become reliant on. Uh, free handouts and don't, I mean, the way you assimilate into a culture is to work with people and trade. That's the way people become successful in a country like ours. Giving them, giving them state aid is the way to make them uh, resent the rest of the population and to make them insular. They can, they are paid to stew in their basements, plotting the destruction of the United States and hate all the kafirs, and uh, that's just not a good system. So I think. Well, that, you're accusing American Muslims of being like this. No, well, I, I wouldn't want to be. Uh, I wouldn't want to put a, a, a pro Christian sign in Deer, on the streets of Dearborn, Michigan. There are places in America that are they're becoming no go zones, and I would And it's partly because of Islam, and partly because the American state is subsidizing these people rather than. Um, what's what was the great salutary neglect is that one of the great that was what made the United States the United States was the principle in in uh, the period in uh, British history where they basically just let the American colonies do what they want. Well, hold on, slow down just a little. Don't slow down just a little. Um, uh, surely not all American Muslims are wards of the state. No, but too many of them are. And the nice do you have thing a about figure? America, no, 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 no. But the, the, the nice thing too many about America. Well, yeah. Is, it the, many, same, is it the same too percentage? Too many black people in America do, too. Too many white people are. But right now, what, what I'm saying is that in Europe, a huge, the, the vast majority of Muslims, Muslim immigrants, are on the dole. In America, that's not the case. But the ones that are on the dole are more dangerous than the ones that are off. And the more we have them on the dole for longer periods of time, the more dangerous they're going to be. Well, I, I just have to say, I, I, the only reason I brought it up is because I've known Muslims who were enterprising and independent yeah. and self-reliant and 
We're, we're none of these. I, I just said that our Muslims are better than everybody else's. <laughs> well, they're not. Well, I don't think they're plotting against. Well, most aren't. But it's yeah. not a question of most. It's a question of what number, and it's on the margin. And and the way to increase that margin and get that number up is to subsidize them. I mean, it was uh, what was it Ferris, uh, Ferris, whatever is the uh, theorist. The, the main supporter of terrorism, Muslim terrorism around the world, are the governments of Europe and Canada and Australia. They're the one because because most terrorists on the dole in these countries. And the main, the, the, main, the main supporter of terrorists is, are the governments of, those, of those, those countries. It's not the United States. But the more we give money to immigrants, the more they're going to move from assimilation to resentful, uh, you know, resentful um, counterculture. And we don't want a Muslim counterculture in America. We want Muslims to uh, adopt to, uh, the, the, the free way of life. And the thing to get to do is just kick them off the dole. I think all, there should be no one in America that the, the federal tax money goes to, right immediately. I mean, we should just take them off and and do deal with it as we can. What and, are you talking about, everybody or just the Muslims? Just the Muslims to start. No, no, no. Every every alien, illegal or non-illegal, should get no should get no tax funds from the, from the federal government. And if a state wants to do it, they can tax their own people, but they can't. Ta- they can't take uh, use of uh, federal government funds. That should be a constitutional amendment. Is that is it's something to those effects? And I, I've, I've worded it out somewhere, but I'm not going to mention it here. But, but that, that would be a great thing to do. That would be one very important uh, reform to do right away. And that would be a, so. Would be a so, good... so again, uh, so again, your opposition will say, so you're okay with these poor immigrants starving if that's what it comes to when they get here. Dying without without medical assistance and starving and no, I'm, I'm dying you know, in the street. No, that would be fine with you. No, and if, the Mus- and, 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 and if the Muslims don't help don't help those poor people, well, that's their fault. Well, it really would be their fault. I mean, because because it's it's their religion to help their kind. It's not their religion to help other kinds. It's the religion to help their kind. So if they, if they, if there are Muslims dying on the streets, it's going to be their fault. Okay, so that is an important point to remember. It's also important to remember remember just how many uh, Syrian refugees that Saudi Arabia took in. Okay, so there are Muslims that don't do the right thing, but I think the American Muslims will stand up, step up to the plate. I'm not okay with people dying on the streets. I just think that we should do it through charities. So if somebody says, ooh, it's awful that there are people dying on the streets, then why aren't you giving the charity? Okay, if you think that the only why, way that words, why do we assume people, why do we assume government force is the is the way to solve yeah the and and I know why they do but I just I think that we should uh, we should you know pull the mandate on that issue right away uh, so that would be a fun issue to that would be fun to uh, handle uh, though there would of course be a huge backlash but the nice thing is is the thing about not giving welfare to to uh, to illegal aliens or aliens of any kind. Uh, by aliens, you mean people, not citizens. People right. who are not citizens. Right. In fact, I, I would like to, I want to just decrease the welfare to, you know, immediately start, you know, start decreasing the welfare to citizens. But the first thing you got to do is get off, get off the dole uh, from people who are not even citizens. And, uh, and again, you get this as steps. You could, and there could be problems with this. Maybe, well, maybe doesn't it's, the same problem exist if, if charitable organizations start subsidizing subsidizing this population? I mean, yeah. how, how is making, how is turning the, the duty over to charitable organizations? Well, because, because well, the stop, nice stop, the, stop the, the nice poison is less effective on, on, on subsidizing a lot of people. It is. That's, That's one of the reasons why like charity. Say that again. We lost one of the nice things about charity is that it is harder to do than government handouts. It is harder to do. It takes more work, which means that people who want to come here for the goodies aren't going to come here for the goodies. The people who will come into a society that doesn't give them handouts are the people who want to work for it. We want those people. We don't want the people who want to be on the dole. Let them work. In, let them not work in their own countries. Um, this is this is this is not a controversial notion. It shouldn't be controversial at all. Well, it's it's just the whole careless, heartless uh, accusation. Yeah, well, but people who hold your uh, uh, position. Yeah, well, people who think that. Uh, People who think that putting people on the dole and setting them in a trap of poverty for generations upon generation, if they think they're being nice to those people, they are deluded. It's not for it's not just for our sake that I want people not to be on the dole who can work. I want it's for everybody's sake. That's why libertarians don't like state aid. We want 
charities to do it because they can control and they can help people. You know, when, when local, when even most charity, most state aid was done in the old days, you know, it was done at the local level. So people could control who got what and help people to find work so that they weren't continually and generation after generation on the system. But this current system has just ruined whole cultures in America. Well, it seems structured to destroy the host. Well, see, that's, that's, that's of course, an important truth, yeah. Uh, and uh, the interesting question is, how far could we take this idea? I, I think we can take it all the way with no state aid whatsoever, but maybe we just have to push it back to, to, to limit it more and more until we find out where we get, how much we can get away with. Uh, well, you do think the state should do some no. things to take care of citizens, right? I don't know. Maybe the state shouldn't exist. I don't know that. That's the thing that I have open. The state might not, may not, should, maybe the state should not exist. Maybe all institutions should be done by contract and voluntary basis, including police, justices, courts, all that kind of stuff. That might be true. I don't know if that's true. But I don't think that the state's business is, you know, giving people. For instance, the state messes up most of this. We're now in this huge problem with Social Security where it's insolvent. And every generation, they have to fix it again and make the deal worse off for young people. And that's what's happened. It was a really good deal for the first uh, adopters, the, the, for the first people who, who got, the, got the Social Security. But it's been a tougher and worse deal as an investment every generation. Why? Because it's based as a Ponzi scheme. So we know now that pension systems aren't really well done when the government is micromanaging them. As a, pen, as a state pension system, Chile's is better. Chile doesn't have a social security system anymore. They devolved it to, to, to require people to invest in their own retirements. It's a better system. How far can we go that way? I don't know. I would like to try going further that direction. I think that we shouldn't have any state aid. But that's, we'll see how far we can go in that direction. Let's start with getting non-citizens off the dole. Solve one set of problems and let's work with it. And then we'd start peeling back. And then another thing we have got to do is we have got to have to do things. But, you, but you're certain that the direction to go is peeling back, peeling back the state. Of course. Isn't it, couldn't, it, couldn't it be making things better? I mean, aren't we on this, aren't we on this great, road uh, you know to improvement and progress that's we're on the we're on the we're, we're still everything let's see how can i put this um it there's why sweep away what we've worked so hard to build why not just build on this now and try to perfect the parts and the okay. systems so let's, let's, let's take that to apply it to one area that's that's grown in the last 30 years our prison population it works so well we have so many people in, in, in prisons, and we have a nice private public partnership in some places, uh, though it's not as big as people think. Uh, we have lots of people employed, uh, lots of state functionaries putting people in prison, a lot of people who have done bad things, and they are bad things often, even if, even if they aren't really criminal, but they've never made criminal. So we've done so good, so why peel that back? Well, because that's a bad system. We put too many people in prison. Similarly, we have too many people not working because we have a, a whole set of institutions that favor people not working. Well, that's bad. And it's not a great system. We haven't worked so hard to make something great. We have worked so hard to make something not very good. We have, we're, we're heading towards a number of secular disasters. The, the trend lines aren't looking good. And one of those trend lines is the level of secular unemployment. That's a bad trend line. The number of people... One good trend line is that more and more people are getting rich. But another trend line is that, uh, is that some people are still sort of stuck in poverty and we seem to have a, quite a lot of people completely dependent upon the state. Well, that's just bad. And it's bad because it's not sustainable because we know we can look at the numbers. Sustainability is something you can look just by the numbers. You don't need to, you don't need to engage in really, really fancy statistics to understand sustainability in a, in a government program. You look at it and it's not, not sustainable. Social security is not sustainable as is. Medicare is in worse shape. And then of course we have insane ideas like putting everybody on Medicare. So you have a system that's doomed to failure at its current place and their way of saving it is to buy, put more people on Medicare. I don't buy this kind of reasoning. I think that that's one of the reasons we, uh, you know, a good third of the American population is absolutely disgusted with the Democratic Party. 
Now, the reason they're discussed, it, there's a good two thirds of the population discussed it with, a, uh, with a, at least a third discussed it with Republicans, is they're disgusting. I mean, the Republicans, Republicans aren't doing good at what they say they're going to do. They've pretended to be the party of limited government or low government or small government for years, and they haven't delivered. So the, it's, it, the Republican Party is, is, is also doomed to fail. All our political institutions. Well, they seem right on the brink of, of collapse right now. Is that it's just the Republican Party? It's the Democrats who are on the brink of collapse. You don't think the Republicans are as well? They might be. Uh, both parties can go. We could actually have a situation where both parties are completely complete failures within five years. Um, the Democratic Party has has never has never had as bad a bad of a showing. I don't think ever in its history uh, in, in in states state after state in, in legislature uh, the presidency they, they just lost everywhere and now they're embroiled in a controversy that's just under the radar from everybody. But it looks like uh, this could be the worst scandal in American history. Uh, what the Democrats in Congress have done with security and and being probably blackmailed by a family of Pakistanis. This is this is this is astounding. People. Say, so is this some conspir- conspiracy cuckoo thing going around? No, no. This 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 arrests have been made and investigations are ongoing, and the the media is basically burying the story. Well, so how did you get the story? Well, because some people are reporting on it, but it's 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 not. It's, it's a known thing, but it's just not being made much of yet. I just think it's going to be huge. So what would somebody look, where would, what would somebody look under to find, find out about it? Uh, you might look up uh, Democratic Congressional IT Scandal, uh, because it's about the IT, uh, uh, the Democratic Party. Uh, so like, let's check, do we, get, do we get a bunch of right-wing websites come up? Is Forbes? Right wing. <laughs> so, no, uh, that's that's where that's where I read about it. Is it Forbes? But there have been there have been right wingers talking about it because the left wing isn't dealing with it at all because it makes their side look really bad. This is one of the things that most left wingers, you know, the media is sort of in bed with the Democratic Party. We have a scandal brewing in the Democratic Party that looks like it's to be twice the size of. Uh, I mean, this is really bad. I mean, this is could lead to air, uh, blackmail of does. I mean, I think there's eighty more than eighty uh, legislators. But the press loves this kind of stuff. Surely they'd be like sharks after blood. But not for Democrats. It's only if it's Republicans do they want to do. The reason the Watergate was a big issue was because it was the Republican Party. It was Nixon in particular. They've been trying to get catch Trump in something like this for a full year now. The, the, the media has been working very mightily. They're trying not to look at the Clinton problems and the the Clinton scandals and the uh, and the IT scandal in Congress. And it's a huge, it looks to me like it's just horrendous. Well, the cognitive dissonance seems to be rattling them to the bones. I've, uh, a discussion with, a, with a, a, an American progressive right now is like something out of the twilight zone. It's well, yeah. like they can't hear themselves talking. No, no. But of course, they wouldn't be alone on that. I mean, everybody's so partisan and polarized right now is that you can't see. I mean, I would love to see both parties go down and Americans scramble to find better representation. And to see the Democratic Party completely discredited, which I think is possible, is going to probably happen. I mean, we're going to, if 80 congressmen are implicated in corruption, uh, corruption and and uh, being bribed because they have been, they've allowed their security to be breached by people they've not vetted to run their IT systems in Congress, uh, their computers, their networks, and so forth, uh, that's going to be huge. Well, all along the government's be, been behind the been behind the curve as far as uh, uh, technology. Uh, Except the NSA, the NSA is doing a pretty good job. Well, they're catching up. They're <laughs> yeah. catching up, but notoriously, there was a lot of yeah. there was a lot of surprise yeah. when people started realizing how far behind they were. Uh, yeah. well, even one, thing mer- remember, one thing you have to remember, I think, about when it comes to IT and government, is that you can see what government's all about when you realize. Well, Paul Jacob boarded this out in one of his, his pieces a year ago. Um, when you realize that the most common form of communication and the most important aspect of almost everybody's individual economy has become their computers and the internet, and you realize the government's getting involved in security and has never offered any bit of security to any citizen of the United States. Governments are supposed to be allegedly helping people with their security issues. That's what governments are there for, right? 
to protect our rights and to make sure that we're secure in our persons and property. But they've done the exact opposite. They don't care about our persons and property, not even local government. No one helps people. People have to pay for their own security and computers, and they have to b go begging and, and, and uh, you know. Well, wait a minute. What are we paying the taxes for? Well, that's, that's the, that's the, that's the, the million-dollar question. I think that this shows that we can't trust our governments. So the reason the governments are behind the curve, they're, they're much further worse than we even thought because they never help out citizens. Their, the governments are only interested in helping citizens against allegedly against terrorists, so I think they do a horrible job at that, and allegedly against foreign powers, which they do a horrible job at that. But really, because the government is just a huge jobs program for people who've been to college, that's largely what government is. Uh, it's not really a it's not really a system that's designed to help anybody other than the people necessary as innocent shields for the class of people that run governments, the functionary class. It's government employees. That's who government serves. And that's one of the reasons. Wait a minute. Don't they do lots of useful things, though? I mean, they. Well, yeah, they, they, they enforce minimum wages that makes things worse for the poor. They, uh, they, they enforce insane. Uh, they, they now, almost every bureau of the federal government now carries arms around so they can shoot people who don't agree with them on questions of how they put uh, use water on their lands. I mean, they they dispossess. They just do awful things all over the place, and people just think, well, oh, go so you're, like the I presume you'd include the drug war. And oh, uh, the worst thing the thing American government has ever done. You know, it's the drug war is arguably worse than slavery. Um, it's because slavery was at least a was least a horrible thing that was a business, uh, you know, you might say a, a government-private uh, business partnership. Uh, the drug war is a is 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 a complete clusterfuck of of of, of government screwing up American lives and, and lives of people around the world. We made hell holes out of whole countries in the, in Latin America because of this one stupid program, which for a long time many Americans liked because why? Because they were p appealed to on the basis of their idiotic ideologies. And basis on fear, and governments are great at fear mongering. And and so one thing that I should I, I need to always worry about is to what extent have, have I bought government lines on fear, uh, because I'm you know, because let's say terrorism. I mean terrorism isn't as bad a problem in America as it is in Europe, and uh, maybe terrorism isn't as bad as we think. I mean, there's a lot of things we should be worried about, and the government is 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 a huge liar, and we can't believe anything the government says about much of anything. You know that. I mean government what they said about drugs for years. Is largely untrue. Everything the government has ever said about marijuana should just be thrown in the thrown in the in the in the, uh, in the river and uh, floated out to sea. I mean, this well, now, I, 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 we live in Washington, and now that I've had a chance to to sample marijuana, I <laughs> I have to say it's I am so um, amazed that. This, the, the state doesn't come crashing down after the amount of bloodshed and misery and horrific corruption that the state is devoted uh, to creating. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's all for the maybe, it's, it's, maybe as maybe as pot becomes more and more legal across the country and people see how absolutely deluded and lied to they've been. Oh yeah. I mean, are, can but can you ever get through to people about the damage that's being done? It's hard. It's hard because people have these ideologies that are pretty hidebound. And uh, look, I, I I don't drink use marijuana. I don't even drink. I like to drink alcohol like once or twice a week. And uh, I think moderation is the goal for most most things in life. And I understand why people are afraid of drugs. They should be, because people who abuse them can ruin their lives what people have got to get over is the idea that because some people ruin their lives with something it's an excuse to treat everybody like a child or worse and run ride herd over all of society that's just that's that's one thing that from one thing another does not follow and americans have been bought into many status ideas for years and that's the good thing about libertarianism is we can keep on pushing one very basic idea well they keep seeing failure after failure after failure though and they don't it doesn't seem to have any effect. Well, it's well, as I said, as if they were under trance. Well, yeah. Well, why are progressives still pushing socialism? Because they're fucking nuts. That's one way of looking at it. The other way, I mean, anyone who pushes socialism is a nut. Okay, and this is a worse nut. A worse nut could not be imagined. The drug war looks like peaches and cream compared to socialism. Socialism is a disaster wherever it's been tried. Nevertheless, lots of people on the left flirt with socialism to this day, and they get a lot of respect, and they get 
taught in colleges that socialism is good. And the younger generation seems to be thinking that socialism is better than ever before because they know nothing. Because they've been raised in government schools that do a bad job of teaching. They don't teach history worth a damn anymore. Uh, and in fact, they never teach it, taught, taught it very well. And it's, all, it's, just a, it's, it's a mess on every level. And uh, so why do people believe these things? Because they want to believe these things and because they're tribal animals. And because we use ideas in politics, like we use them in religion, to signal other things. Those other things I think libertarians are just more direct about. If you want to be a cooperative indi individual, don't rely on, don't rely on some weirdo uh, uh, notion that has no bearing on reality, like socialism or the drug war. You know, I'm, I'm a good person. I don't take drugs. There's a good reason to hire you. Uh, no, the good reason to hire you is that you seem like a reasonable person. You're competent. Uh, you can signal people good things about you without having to do, believe idiotic things. And, uh, Libertarianism is actually, as radical as it seems to other people, is actually a very simple set of ideas. And one of them is that the division of responsibility is better than concentrating a responsibility into the hands of centralized power, which we know to be not work. I mean, every common sense person knows that concentrating responsibility into centralized power is a bad idea. When you put it like that, they should know that, I mean, it's, we're not crazy, right? Except that they believe in socialism, they believe in the drug war, they believe in the Federal Reserve, they believe in all sorts of things that don't work very well. Yeah, I, I'm amazed by, Amer by Americans or by anyone. But people don't think through this stuff very much because they, uh, well, for one thing, they're rationally ignorant. So, are you want to say that again? Rationally, rationally ignorant. Because government, politics says it doesn't pay you anyone to spend a lot of time on politics. You have to be kind of a crazed individual. And that's kind of what libertarians are, too, is that we think we thought something out. Uh, and we uh, insist that people, you know, take a step back and hey, be reasonable people. Uh, but uh, to spend a lot of time on politics doesn't make much sense because you don't, very few people get a direct payoff of spending a lot of time at it. In fact, the early adopters of libertarianism, the reason the early adopters are so weird is because to be anything in politics is to be a little bit weird if you're not going to get a payoff in terms of a cushy job or a big subsidy. Well, libertarians are asking for no cushy jobs and no big subsidies, so who's left to be libertarians? People who are a little bit nutty on the system of ethics. They want they, they they want to concentrate and they and they and so you get people who look a little bit weird to people. You know that's what the like, really like me like like you exactly. Uh -huh. It's us, but it's, or, uh, our guys who run naked across the stage or uh, yeah that, that kind of stuff that yeah. happens. You know because we have we have we have a different way of looking at the world and uh, and uh, I mean it's getting better because it's, it's more and more people become libertarians. Uh, we're getting you know not early adopters but secondary and ter uh, tertiary uh, adopters, and that's good. Uh, we need to, it needs to see nah, but these kids aren't like like we we guys used to be though yeah well maybe they don't know that they don't know well they don't they don't know what it was like back in the old days but they know what it's like now uh, I, I find that some things about the young libertarians to be kind of funny but that's that's okay every older generation looks at the younger generation as kind of funny and to some degree that's just we should just count that up out of hand and when it comes to libertarianism that's probably that case but boy we've really it's torn into libertarianism <laughs> In this well, argument well, against libertarians uh, episode, well, uh, you know, I, mean, I think the argument against libertarians is pretty weak, but it, it's there, and I think I know what it looks like. The other thing that I haven't mentioned, and uh, was the other, do, does, do do any of your do any of your arguments uh, include we could be completely wrong? Well, I don't. The, the likelihood of being completely wrong seems to be. Uh, oh yeah, but in a sense, yes. I'm not completely wrong. I mean. The fact that we don't want to have unstable systems and, and, and systems doomed to uh, doomed to failure by their by their unsustainability and their lack of accountability and responsibility, yeah, that's not that doesn't seem like it's it's a, it's a very bad set of ideas, and I don't think I'm going to be wrong about that. But whether how far we can go, I don't know how far we can go with this stuff. I think that we can go a long ways. In fact, I I suspect we can go all the way. I suspect that 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 uh, that the ultimate uh, that a, a better political system will look nothing like what we have now. But we're such a long ways away from it that let's be a little respectful of normal people who, after all, don't spend a lot of time thinking about you know economics and sociology and social psychology. And if they do, they usually use it to bolster one of their goofy ideas like uh, the drug war or, or socialism, which are stupid ideas. But uh, I don't know, what can, you, what can you do? I mean, we, we can only do what we can do. The big argument against libertarianism, I didn't really quite get to, um, is the... Is actually a social Darwinistic argument. 
people say the, the bad thing about libertarianism is that it's you know social darwinism and you know uh, uh every man for himself and let the devil take the hindmost that's actually not what that's not the social darwinistic element of libertarianism that's not a very good explanation of what libertarians believe or uh, uh argue for but there is a social darwinistic reason not to think that it, it may not work and that is the argument from parasitism and I've talked about this before, I think, with you. And, and the argument is that we know that you and me, every human being, is not just human. A human individual is not just a human being biologically. It's also a colony of a bunch of bacteria uh, that together form a stable system that allow uh, the organism to survive and the, the, symbionts, to, uh, to, the symbionts to, to survive. But many of these symbionts, if they get to be, are parasites by their very nature. That is, they're parasitic in one way and symbiotic in another. The hookworm is a grand example. The hookworm uh, is, well, if you look at that thing in the microscope, that is one scary beast. If you blew it up to the size of a house, we would all be, we would all be talking, you know, uh, a, a end of the world scenario here because those are those are horrific looking beasts. We have a science fiction novel, right, right, a science fiction movie in the making. Uh -huh. I don't know why they haven't made a hookworm just as a, just made that as the alien in some <laughs> science fiction film. However, hookworms in our gut, apparently, though they are behave like parasites, for many, maybe many or all people, uh, to some degree, to a, a certain amount of them, works with our immune system to make us immune to a lot of, a lot of problems. But if you have too many of them, all of a sudden you become sick. So there's a there's an optimum new, a, amount of these. At some level, the, the hookworm is is a, a symbiont, but above that level, it becomes parasitic and becomes deleterious to, our, to your health. But if you don't have some hookworms in you, you might have a bad immune system. So, so you're saying there must be some elements, some okay. profound elements of of, of anti-libertarianism as a part of a libertarian society? There, well, as a part of any good stable society, there may need as to be- As part of a free society. Right. And maybe that parasitic or predatory aspect is just simply the natural level of, of, uh, of criminals in society. Maybe it's not, you know, maybe it's not the loser. Well, what, what, what utility do criminals serve? Well, there you are. What utility does the hookworm serve? What, there's a lot of weird parasites in our body that actually have symbiotic effects. It's like the process of hormesis. In small doses, it's good, and in large doses, it's bad. And, uh, and well, what was the saying? The price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Right. Is that, is that did I did I phrase it right? Yeah, that's one. That's it's a it's a it's a kind of an annoying phrase, and in some ways, because it's 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 a rhetorical phrase. It doesn't make any sense on the. Well, phrase. I thought here's what I think it says. It says that it says that it, it's it's not a it's not a system that finishes. That is. Well, right. You, you, you can't assume that. It's in place. You never can assume that's in place. Well, that's, that's you can point. never assume there's a way to build a system that assures that it's in place. Well, it, 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 what it really says is, is actually is if people stop believing in freedom, they're not going to be free. Okay, I believe that. Uh, that's and that's the question is. But the question really then becomes is what institutions and what policies work against encouraging people to be free. And I believe there's a number in society that are like that. Very well, strong. Stop, stop for just a second. There's a lot of definitions of free. When you say free, what, what do you mean in this context? I, I just mean, basically, I mean people not being, you know, it, it being uh, bullied around by others. Let's just put it in terms of bullying or expropriated by others. Yeah, I see it as constrained or coerced. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. However, also, when we say people are free, we expect people also to take control of their lives. Most people will be taking control of their lives, and that is the goal for police. That is that is the, the level of aspiration, or the basic obligation, not to initiate force. There's also we expect people to aspire to something better. Well, see, this this gets better. back to your sto social Darwinism thing a minute ago, though. The, the, you're aware of the argument. You understand there the, are a number of social Darwinistic ar arguments, right? But what makes libertarianism not a social Darwinist system is that we, we don't believe that people will or should uh, let other people just die, you know, helter-skelter. Not willy-nilly, helter-skelter. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we know that because we, we know that human beings in their families, in their clans, in their communities, uh, and in their explicit organizations help each other. And we also know that the most effective way of helping each other is through, the, through trade. 
but also community, direct community action and charity. And there's a whole bunch of ways that people help each other. And we want people to help each other. That's what we were hoping for is voluntary community, not coerced community. So that's a libertarian idea. So the idea that it's every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost is insane because we're trying to set up institutional frameworks that, that people are helping each other in a you know, great, great variety of ways. We just don't think that we and should all of our yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. All of our cooperative eggs in one basket, the state. That's insane. That's just a bad way of doing it. We believe in specialized administration of tasks. And the state, if it should exist, should only have a few tasks, which is to protect basic rights. That's the libertarian idea. And and maybe the state should be dissolved for competitive, competitive and cooperative contractual uh, defense agencies. Maybe that's what we should have. But we'll see when we'll, we we'll get closer. The real question, uh, the 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 so the complaint that people have that social Darwinism is kind of is is off point about libertarians because they always imagine that the only way to help each other is through the state. It's a dumb idea. It's actually a very stupid idea because the state isn't really has never been in the business of helping people so much as of exploiting people. The, the state is an instrumentality of coercion. That's its origin is in conquest and in exploitation. That's the origin of it. But it does want to encourage people to uh, succeed in some ways so they can leech off of it. I mean, the, the state is an old institution that captures high areas. Hey, so, you got to say it again. We, we lost the signal. The state is an institution that conquers people and rules them, but it does encourage them to succeed so that it can leech off them. And it tends to conquer and attach itself. No, but in America, the state is us. It's we the well, people. But that's not what a state is. We, we pretend, people pretend all sorts of things. We're citizens. And that's, a, that's an okay model. Uh, and we do allow the state to exist. But, if you're, but the state is not we the people. We the people are the people. The state is the state, and it's an institution that has more uh, powers than we do. And it has the power to tax you and me. We don't have the power to tax. We can't go to our neighbor and say, okay, you owe 5% of your uh, income to me. Uh, that's just, that doesn't fly. It's only through the, you know, the, the state has this uh, taxing power and it has this coercive power that we don't, you and I don't have. Uh, we're just trying to get the state to whittle down those coercive powers. And, you know, it, the, the argument's really old. Uh, but what I'm saying is that there is a social Darwinist argument that maybe libertarians underestimate the utility of, of predatory and parasitic, parasitic uh, elements within society. Those could be criminals. Those could be, uh, you know, state aid, uh, permanent, permanent uh, uh, clients of the state, of the welfare state, for instance. Maybe we need to have 5% of the population on the dole. Well, you know, I'm not so sure I, I'm not so sure I have a problem with the, uh, some minimal safety net. Well, no, well, almost none of us do. Most libertarians would love to have it. We just don't think that it's going to work. See, the thing is that the problem with programs like that is that they don't stay minimal because that's not the way those systems work. They're not. They don't, they don't form stable systems. They always maw in more people, and they encourage more people. to. When you get, make, make living for people cheap, they're going to engage in those behaviors that, get, that allows them to capture an easy living. There is going to be a percentage of the population that does that. That's one problem. Another problem is that if you make redistribution a function of government, then the groups that depend on that, for instance, the functionary class, are going to push that as an ideology. And ideologies always wish to increase their, there's a sort of a entelechy built in with an idea. And once you start redistributing wealth, it doesn't stop with a minimal transfer state. I mean, you know, Hayek talked about a minimal transfer state, and you know, Sargon of Akkad thinking was we can have. No, oh, but the Dan the the the, the, the uh, Nord Nordic nations have have found how to maintain the. Uh, no, no a if minimalist, you look at them, they've done a really horrible job. Mm -hmm. they, have, they, have, they have they have systems that are also not stable, and they are actually increasing the the, the, the number of people who are abusing the system. They have lots and lots of problems. In fact, one of the the great example was the recent uh, revelation in, in Business Insider of uh, the permanent class of, of, of you know, seven, eight, 10, 12 year students, the eternal student, uh, eternity students. Uh, and that's if you make something free, then people are going to adopt a free, uh, uh, you know, a handout posture. Oh, yeah, it's free. So I'm going to do this for as long as possible. I'm going to increase my uh, uh, increase my level of irresponsibility for as well, long what's as wrong with what's wrong with get, making sure your citizenry is highly educated? Well, highly educated in what? 
once again, uh, if if what they're le learning about, it would be one thing if they learned the productive enterprise, the people, uh, productive skills that people wanted. So you'd be okay with state-funded education if that were the case. Well, I would be better with it, but state-funded education education is just tend to degrade over time anyway. I mean, there are there are always counterexamples, and state education can be made to be, you know, emulate private systems. Uh, Finland emulated a, a more of a Montessori kind of approach, and they've done a better job with public edu education than America has. But that being the case, um, I don't think there's really much hope for American education to transform itself because it, in America, we don't do government well. That's one of the great interesting things about America. One of the reasons our government sucks so bad is because America isn't really a, a, a civilization based on the idea of good government. It's, the base, it's based on the idea of limited government and individual excellence and competition and cooperation in the voluntary sphere. That's where we're good at. The more you put Americans investing in the state, the worse our state's gonna get. Why? Our culture's not like that. Yep, yep, so yep, yep. We found out hold up, hold up, we lost, we lost the signal, Tim. You gotta start, you gotta go back. You gotta go, back. <laughs> go back a, a sentence. Um, Americans have never been a culture that's good at running states. We're good at private enterprise. We're good at community activity, or were at one point. We, we're good at individual achievement. We're good at cooperating voluntarily. We're good at individual uh, you know, competition among people to, find, to, to hone our skills better. What we're not good at is cooperating in the form of government to make good government services. It may be that we'll discover that Danes and Finns are really good at those things. I'm dubious about that because I look at the level of taxes in those countries and, and, what, and the level of personal debt that those countries have, and I'm thinking they have problems as well. But let's say, let's, let's arguendo, the Scandinavian countries are just wonderful uh, systems. We're not Scandinavian. You know, it was a great, uh, Milton Friedman had a great, great retort when somebody said, well, look how good the Swedes are doing. He says, well, look how good the Swedes are doing in America. Swedish Americans are far above the national average. Maybe there's something about Swedes, at least, and, and that was a great point. Uh, Milton Friedman noted, you know, there are differences between cultures, and some cultures are just better at excellence. So maybe the Swedes can handle more government than we can. There's only a few Swedes in America. Gorbachev had that great, uh, there was that great quote from Gorbachev that, uh, that uh, Yuri Maltsov quoted. Yuri Maltsov was, was one of the advisors to Gorbachev in the last days of the Soviet empire. And uh, one, the leading advisor told Gorbachev that maybe what we need to do is move socialism in the Swedish model. And Gorbachev's response was quite rational. Where will we get all the Swedes? <laughs> and uh, and uh, that's the real question. The problem of, of Nordic socialism is where are we going to get all the Nordic peoples? You know, maybe they can handle it, but Americans can't. We have a vast diversity of people, and then we're just not going to be able to handle that kind of stuff. And it's showing pretty well and pretty obviously that the influx of Muslim people into Sweden is probably going to destroy their welfare state. And Swedes are uh, Swedes have basically... Uh, lobotomize themselves not really uh, handling it because they're ideologues for their system. They believe that, they, that, that their superpower status is as, as a nation of charitable enterprise. So they have most of their Muslims that they've led in their country don't work, as if that's a great success. You know, the great success is if you let people do your country and they work. To go back to one of my earlier proposals, it's not a great success to, success to let a, pop, a lot of people into your country and then subsidize them forever. That's stupid. Stupid people believe things like that. And Swedes strike me as fools. <laughs> we can't end there. <laughs> like it, like it. What, it's, it's a, <laughs> what a strange place to end. <laughs> well, I, well, I remember, I remind, I'm tired. We should go one more. That if we, <laughs> instead of ending there, let me double down on that. <laughs> okay. We live, you and I live in an area that's a that, uh, heavily Scandinavian population. Like when I was a kid, it was like half Finns and a quarter uh, Norwegian. Are, are, are you about to start a war between the Finns and the Swedes? They actually didn't the get Swedes. along in the old days. The Swedes, the Norwegians, and the Finns didn't get along very well. And there was a lot of bad blood, I was told. I never saw it ever. We all got along great pretty much as these various groups because we became Americans by my generation. But, you know, 50 years before my, I mean, it was, it was a, there was a lot of resentment between these groups. And uh, that led to a number of really nasty jokes about each other. Uh, and I don't remember any of, the, any of the, I only remember one joke, and that was the, it wasn't really a joke so much as a rhyme. 10,000 Swedes running through the weeds with one Norwegian behind them. 
And uh, so we can't idealize groups of people, even if they're good at something, they may not be good at others. And we don't want to emulate what other countries seem to have success with. We need to work with what we've got. And what we've got is not something like Sweden. It's not less something like Denmark. We've got to work with what we have. And we have a diverse population that needs to become more responsible and accept the division of responsibility of a free society. And I don't see any reason to doubt that. How far we can go in that direction, let's leave that to the future generations or to, the, to there when we get there. But we're not at that point right now. We can't even figure out how to build down and make a sustainable pension system. We can't even convince people that, uh, that uh, the pension systems, the governments at the sto- state and local levels are dangerous. You know, a number of cities and uh, counties and states around the country are on the vig- have gone bankrupt or are going bankrupt, and other states and cities are not taking the lesson very well. Stockton went bankrupt. Was a, there's a number of c- cities that have gone bankrupt and have to reform, and they've had to really screw over their former employees because they just simply couldn't afford the pension systems they'd set up. So politicians tend to promise too much and can't deliver in the future. And that's a problem of responsibility on the parts of politicians and ideologies that demand that more and more be given and paid in the future are dangerous, dangerous ideas. And we have to start being reasonable about what we can deliver. And that's where we have to start with. We have to start with level of the pension system, the healthcare system, and we have to unbuild government and not build new levels of irresponsibility. So here's where I am. To me, I'm convinced you sound eminently reasonable, but then I try to imagine what you must look like to people who disagree with you, or just normal people. And I, I, I'm afraid what they see is a sort of a, a wild-eyed radical. That is somebody who, who uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, I don't see how to get a. How do you? Well, that's that's so that's contrary to the way that to the way that culture, the sort of Im- implicit beliefs of the, the reality we find ourselves in right now, that um, I don't see how you, <laughs> I don't see how you break the veil there. Well, you do one issue at a time, and 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 also explicate the basic idea. And over time, more and more people come that direction, and you also relentlessly make fun of really bad ideas. Not only do you have good explanations for why they don't work, you also make fun of bad ideas. So, so well, it is it is one of the great it, it is one of the great puzzles that the left is actually chasing away its humorists. I mean, there's this brilliant generation of humorists who are becoming <laughs> disgusted with uh, uh, the sort of political uh, uh, correctness, thought police uh, 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 momentum of of left of left wing culture. They're driving away one of their most powerful weapons. They're losing them, and they don't even realize it. Yeah, well, they, of course, what we're really talking about is the one batch of the far left. We have to remember that there's another group of the far left that isn't like this, right? Noam Chomsky thinks the French theorists are complete idiots and, and, and kind of insane people. And that includes, and the French theorists include pretty much all the intersectionalists and all that. Noam Chomsky is a far left, you know, to me, he's a wacko socialist anarchist of an idiotic sort. He was a liber- he's, didn't he? He wrote for Inquiry, Inquiry Magazine. I was a libertarian. Well, that's, that's because, because on, on some foreign policy issues, policy issues, we can agree with them on. Okay, but sorry, not that's, all, a, not that's, all. A, that's a silly not diversion. All. Go ahead. Yeah, but but uh, but he's he doesn't buy into all that nuts nut, 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 stuff. And, and the center left is probably coming to the senses now. There's a lot of people on the center left that's looking at the at the, uh, the those little uh, those little uh, Stalinists on the campus. And Maoists, and you know all those, all those little, those little scumbags, and uh, and they and they think, oh, this is bad. This is they don't know what to do about it because they haven't figured out how to argue against somebody close to them. They've been so used to marginalizing people who are not of the left that now they have to realize, oh, we have to marginalize some leftists in our midst. They haven't bitten that bullet yet. When they do bite that bullet, they will then consolidate some of their positions because these people on the the intersectionalists, the postmodernists, the whole French theorist, uh, uh, Frankfurt School, post-Marxian, neo-Marxian, uh, culture warriors, all that social justice kind of that crowd, they have to be marginalized from the left. And at some point, the left probably will do it. 
I hope it's after they've lost pretty much all their advantage, struggle holds on power. But uh, those people have got to go, and they will go at some point because they're nuts. They are cultists. Well, and when the cultists I cultists yeah. are just not going to. Well, so but why? So why then are they a danger? I talked to well, friends of mine, friends right. of mine who claim to be moderately liberal. Right. Um, say, well, those people are nuts. They're fringe groups. We know that. That's not what we're fighting for. Well, that's what they say, but they haven't been able to constrain them, and they won't repudiate the worst elements of, of except very on a few issues they'll repudiate. But they might re repudiate the free speech elements. At some point, that that's going to be the first thing to crack, right? Is that they're going to constrain uh, the 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 bullies on campus? The mob is going to be constrained. And I don't know. It's really embedded in, I mean, yeah. even even middling left culture. I. Some of, some of the gentlest, kindest, kindest um, sort of progressive people I know, I was aghast to see one of them uh, a few months ago posting uh, a plea to the rest of, you know, to the rest of his friends to start pounding uh, uh, the publisher of Milo's books with threats to make them suppress his book. Now, I'm, my friend, I'm sure, considers himself the most tolerant person in the world. It, it's so, and he doesn't realize what he's saying, apparently. Right, right. And that's, that's the thing, is that they have to understand, well, this happen, has to happen up and down the board, is we have to, the, the, the worst ideas have to be, uh, have to be taken away. And, uh, and uh, that's, I think that's obviously the case. And, they, and the left is, is the furthest, they, haven't, they, just, they just don't know how to do it. They haven't done it before, because they, they haven't really had to do it before. And uh, the right has been doing it for a long time. Uh, the right's lost that ability because the right Republican Party and the, and the conservatives betrayed their constituencies so many times over and over again that they lost. The, that's, they, that's why they lost to the Trump, the Trump movement. I mean, the Trump is the end of the, consult, of the ability of the official right to marginalize the nutball right. <laughs> and now the nutball right is kind of strong. But the nutball right is better than the nutball the left. I mean, let's admit, Trump is far better than... Bernie Sanders would have been. Uh, oh, except, see, Lord, somebody's going to hear that and say, Mr. You are insane. Yeah, Bernie like, well, Sanders because, because is this kindly, know. kindly, gentle old man who wants what's best for us. And, and uh, Trump, well, should I, do I even have to explain it to you? Yeah, you do, actually, because, because that's, what they, that's what they don't get, is that they keep on getting bogged down on stylistic issues. They, don't, they, will, they won't confront the fact that Bernie Sanders supported Hugo Chavez and Fidel Castro and all sorts of horrid things that socialist countries have done. You know, he, he, he and his wife had their honeymoon in Moscow when it was the Soviet Union. They were such commies. And he's never repudiated this. They, he just downplays it. They don't understand what Bernie Sanders would do if he could. Now, he's pretending to be something less than he is. But he's probably, he's probably willing to go all Stalinist. And I, I see no evidence that he won't. And they don't realize what, a, because they cannot criticize and they, they're bogged down and they get caught up in rhetoric. You know, because, you know, because Trump said, grab them by the, and Bernie Sanders says this nice thing that they like to hear, they don't see what ideas are actually involved here. Trump is mainly bluster. And Bernie Sanders has embraced the complete pill of communism, and he's willing to shove it down our throats. They don't understand this. They won't understand it because they are naive. Oh, wait a minute. I've heard Bernie. I've heard Bernie disavow the whole idea of of government control of Mr. Smith's grocery store down the street. All he wants to do is beat back the corporations. These these vast rich uh, interests that control the government that should be serving us. Yeah, well, uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons not to believe that. I'm not going to get into it here. I just, I mean, you guys have to look at these closer, folks. This is, this is not what it is. And also, you have to understand that this model of just beating back the corporations isn't going to work. First off, we have to remember is the Democratic Party is the party of the rich. More rich people contribute to the Democratic Party than, the, than rich people contribute to the Republican Party. And the, uh, the reasons for this are built into the nature of progressivism. Governments like plutocracy. And the progressive movement has always been the, 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 
the poor, uh, the poor, and the, and the college students and all that, but they're just dupes for big business and, and, and the very rich in their desire to consolidate power. And so they don't understand that, that that's not, whatever Bernie is saying, if it actually happened, it would have to co completely upset the whole government and there would be a civil war and it would end up being totalitarian against, it would destroy business in America without giving an opportunity because they hate markets. They literally loathe markets. Well, that's sort of the, the, de the definition, the definition of the modern left is, is a hatred of, of uh, free market, right? Yeah. Is think, there a better one? Is there a better one? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's just, they, they, they're so crazed about being against business and thinking that's against free markets because they don't like free markets. They want to increase regulation wherever it goes. And that's not a good sign because the more regulation, the more power government and it's regulations are what big businesses like. Because stop, 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 stop. We lost the right signal back. again. Timo, we lost the signal. Go back a sentence. It's a pity we lose the signal. Um, yeah, I know. Regul more regulation is what bus big business likes. And, that, and because of this, progressives have always been the dupes to big business. And they always will be. And when they actually get an ideologue who is against business and will attack them, the result will be such an attack upon the system that it will become totalitarian. They don't understand what they're playing with. They, don't, they have no clue because they don't really understand economics. They don't understand what they actually have been supporting all along. They what don't they know. do understand is they want to take, they don't want to take care of people. Well, but you know, this is just vacuous uh, virtue signaling and, you know, concern mongering. Uh, you have to have actual real programs that do real things and make real sense, not just vacuous uh, notions of helping people. Because look, the welfare state has destroyed half of the African-American uh, culture in America. Welfare state is turning vast swaths and increasing swaths of American white population into this well, they're, they're destroying the family in America. And uh, they don't realize the extent to which is the case, this is the case. And they're doing it because of their policies. It's not because of some policies of, of the free market. It's happening because they're putting people on the dole and they're encouraging people not to have families because of the structures of the, of, of, of the incentives they give the poor. They're not doing it on purpose, in other words. They're not doing it on purpose, but they're doing it. And they will do it worse once they get in power because they don't understand what they do. I mean, I'd like to say with, uh, uh, like to say with somebody famous on, on a piece of wood, uh, forgive them for they know not what they do. But uh, unfortunately, it's hard to forgive them because they have all the evidence before them. They keep on denying the truth. That's one of the reasons they keep on ideolo ideologically bubbling themselves. I understand their ideas a lot better than they understand mine. That's because I read their crap and I've read their crap for years and nearly everybody who disagrees with them has read their crap. But they don't read the other, other people and that's when they get blindsided by you know, black swans like Trump and uh, whole movements like the alt-right. And, and, and I mean, they don't understand why, for instance, they keep on saying that, you know, what's the matter with Kansas? Why are so many people who are poor, white poor, voting against their interests. Well, that's the level they're dealing with, is that they think that if somebody doesn't agree with them, it's against their interests. Well, maybe they don't understand what people's interests are. Maybe everybody has difficulty understanding what interests are, and then they do a little bit more careful thinking. And that's what I ask them to do, is to start thinking carefully. And talking about concern is not the way to do it. That's just blather. Okay, well, I'm getting tired, but I want to I want to continue something like this. At least I know we've got other plans, but um, I think it's okay to meander, and maybe we'll get some uh, engagement from people who listen, and maybe I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, I find it interesting. I'd like I like getting on record what you have to say. Okay. Um, and what about it, it, what about? Are you going to clip out the parts where I touch my face and blow my nose? And, I'll do what I can, yeah, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time editing, Tim. It's just too much work. Yeah. I would rather just, you know, and I'm not sure what the payoff is. I would rather just put out, it, it's almost like a radio program. Just put it there and we can do it easily and we can at least, you know, get out some ideas and try to try to make some contact with other people that are mulling over the same thoughts. Well, I hope this one worked out okay because I had turned off my uh, quick time and I forgot to restart it when we started again uh, after you. Uh -oh, uh -oh. <laughs> well, I, I'm happy that we're, we're not ending on a, a hate message to the Swedes. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, I know that, I thought it was funny. Uh -huh. um, but uh, the point being, of course, with the Swedes is, is just, just simply that we aren't the Swedes. 
And the idea that you can take one system from another from one country and put it to the another it seems kind of silly to me. Good night. Good night.